how should they approach you? Is it through email? What should be ready with the company to be able to raise those checks? How should the founder think about or come up with the valuation? When should a startup start looking abroad? Good morning everyone and welcome. My name is Henrik Kuusla and I will be with you for the next 40-45 minutes. Um, and, and welcome to this Maria Zero One community breakfast. The Maria Zero One community breakfast is an event where we bring our members together to enjoy some breakfast, some learning uh, and some networking. This is the first one uh, of the year uh, and, and we host them roughly once a month. In every community breakfast, we aim to bring one of the community members to share on their experiences, their learnings, and um, maybe their perspectives. Um, today's speaker has an interesting background. They have firstly uh, been in the shoes of the founders as a serial entrepreneur, and then lately uh, for over a decade as a uh, early stage investor. Our speaker has founded five companies, including Yaiku and First Hop. In addition to various startup CXO roles and board memberships, he has been the chairman of Supercell, Grand Crew, Everywhere Games, and Smartly.io. He has experience on public companies as a board member of Elisa, in addition to working for Google in Mountain View and London after its acquisition to Yaiku. In his free time, he hangs out with his family, pumps iron, plays games, writes toy code, and enjoys books and movies. He is currently the chairman of Varjo. And we are, of course, talking about Petter Koponen, the founding partner of Lifeline Ventures. All right. Thank you for coming, Petter. It's, it's our pleasure. You're here today for two reasons. One, because you were kind enough to come, but then second of all, uh, because during the past six months, we have received even more and more questions from our uh, startup founders that they're raising their pre-seed seed rounds, um, but they're lacking on knowledge on, on how to actually do it. Um, some things might be unclear. So we thought that it would be nice to pick your brain, brain on the topic on kind of like, how to approach uh, fundraising your pre-seed seed rounds. Um, and as a goal for today, let's try to build more clarity uh, on the process and the expectation an investor has toward the startup founder when they're raising their pre-seed and seed round. That, that, does that sound okay? That sounds great. And now that I got the mic on, I have to say that it's great to be here. It's been a while since I was here the last time. and. Uh, Let's make this as interactive as possible. Like, if I hope you have questions in the end. Uh, try to answer them as well as I as I can. Wonderful. And I thought we'd do this a bit in like three phases. So kick off uh, with with more focusing on the investor's point of view. Uh, then jumping into to the startup founder's point of view. Answer some of the questions we received from from the participants here and then finish it off uh, lastly with some generative questions that we've gotten from you, the audience, and then as well uh, opening up the mic for some Q&A in the end. Sounds okay? Good, let's, let's jump into it. So first of all, if you can just tell us a bit about LifeLife Ventures um, and maybe another question straight on there, what makes you invest in a startup company? Those two are maybe a bit linked. Okay, so Lifeline is a very early stage investor. So we, we have invested in roughly 120 companies in the last 12 years. Uh, and we only invest in angel and seed rounds. So the first two, two rounds. And we try to invest as often as possible in the angel rounds. It, but because of... I don't know what, but most of our investments are seed rounds. But we love to invest in the very first first round. And, and out of our biggest successes, I think even most of them have been angel rounds, like Supercell, Vault, Applifier, Smartly, and many others. So they, they've been angel investments originally. And then nowadays we have a relatively 
big fund or I would say the standard size fund in Finland nowadays, which is 130 million and we're raising a new one, which is probably going to be a slightly bigger. So we can do follow on investments then in A, B, C, maybe even during at the round round as well. And what we do, I mean, it's we have this sector agnostic strategy. So we we're not limited to specific industries, for example. Uh, and every each partner is very different. Like Timo Ahopelta, for example, has done a lot of med tech stuff and industrial investments. Uh, I've done mostly software. Uh, and then we have a lot of climate related investments, food related investments. What we look for, what's, what's probably unique for us is that we have this high risk, high reward uh, strategy. Like we, every investment should in theory be able to return our fund. And if we have a 130 million euro fund and we own, let's say we assume that we own 10% of the company in the end, if we are very successful in protecting our ownership there, then you know that the company would need to be worth 1.3 billion euros in the end. And so it's, it's really, and it's, it's of course very rare and this rarely happens. Like I think we have had six companies that have been roughly this or more in the end and out of 120. So most of our investments don't really make it, make it. But that's the, initially we, we believe that if, if stars are right and if we have a lot of luck and the entrepreneurs have a lot of luck, then this could, could be possible. So that's the, we see a lot of cases where we can say that, okay, with high likelihood, this could be a 50 million or 100 million euro exit, but we, we try to be very disciplined and we, we don't invest in these, these cases that could be life-changing uh, exits for the founders, and, but they just they are not in our strategy. And of course, there are a lot of details, like what kind of teams. I think this first criteria, this, this kind of high reward criteria also defines the the unique features that we look look in the teams. For example, we we try to imagine the company as a you know five hundred person more mature company that's already valuable, and we look at the team and we tr we try to evaluate whether which team members could be still effective and valuable in this bigger bigger company. Uh, so we kind of really aim at this big, big outcome and, and try to evaluate everything from that perspective. Wonderful. So you mentioned team, um, including, of course, um, the potential to grow into that big company executive. What about the other team members, the, the knowledge on the team? Is it something that you looked at it's already quite complete? Uh, from the basics or do you sometimes help with recru recruiting or forming the, the team? Yeah, we rather rather invest in an incomplete team. Like the team is always incomplete in the beginning, but, but we would rather invest in a two-person really good team than a more complete six-person team where kind of the quality of the the whole team is not as high. So we, we think that it's super important that there's kind of people in the original team that attract talent. And you know it doesn't they don't you don't need that many. Two is enough. Sometimes even one one person. When we invested in Otto Otto Hilska's Swarmia for example, Otto was the sole founder of the company so it was just one person person that we invested in very well very well um 
then I think would be nice to dive into a bit of the process as lifeline. Um, how do the startups get get to talk to you? Uh, how should they approach you? Is it through email? Um, do they need an introduction? Do you approach some of the founders? How does it work? Yeah, we we analyzed actually our our deal flow like out of the investments that we have made what has been the you know the how 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 have the deals originated and i the biggest sources for these for these investments were references from our founders or employees of our companies we try to spend uh as much time as possible with not just the founders but the employees uh, if we if we can and the reason is that they are the next founders so it's kind of a selfish thing from our our perspective uh, but we get references from them uh, and then um, uh, angel investors who we have worked with uh, sometimes quite often like we have a let's say Alan Cortan who is a Based in UK, I think we've made five or six investments with with him already, and and there are several others, so that we get deal flow from them. Then we get just cold emails, which is a good way way of approaching <coughs> approaching us. But you know, my kind of I like haven't had any inbox zero dreams in the last year. So if you send us email, please send it again or uh, send a text message uh, or WhatsApp, WhatsApp message. So it's, it's just impossible to, to follow, follow up from there. But that's basically it. And it's never too early. One of the questions that, that were sent was, that, what's the right timing? I would say it's never too early to, to, to get in touch. And no, mat- no material is needed. But I would say that you need to have the plan plan in mind what do you want to do and with whom maybe even that's that can be a bit fuzzy but then that can be discussed as well do you feel that that's kind of like industry general here in finland or or is your kind of approach different to many of the other firms in in your well that's there's not that many actors in your stage but let's say the early stage the the seed stage um, for example Yeah, I, th- I think it's pretty. I, of course, I don't know the details or how exactly the other other investors approach this, but in general, I think the barrier of there's there's not a high barrier of approaching the investors, or they are not. If there's an interesting idea, like an investor is automatically, you know, get gets excited. It's uh, the hard thing, of course, is to know what exactly int- kind of makes the investor interested, and uh, like who who of our we have three partners at the moment, and with some a bit different profiles. So who to contact, for example, like if it's a medtech case, I always uh, forward it to Timo, and if it's a marketplace, you Halinforce. We'll look at look at it and so on. And we've tried to write something on our website, but it's it could be better. Okay, okay. So let's say you meet up for the first time with the founders. How is that meeting structured? Are you expecting to get a pitch, or uh, are you bombarding the founder with questions? How how does that meeting look? Yeah, I personally I don't like. I, I I I've gotten very tired of like typical pitching. Like if somebody starts to really pitch the case, since it's it's like a one directional thing. And if you if you have a deep conversation with with a friend or an expert, it's not a pitch. Like it's 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 more a a discussion. And I try. I mean, I usually sometimes I talk too much, but I try not try to listen as much as I I can in these these discussions but it's more like a discussion and if you really know what you want to do then the it's almost semi automatically quite structured like this is the plan this is the problem this is what we want to do 
uh, these are the next next steps, and this is why we need funding and and so on. So it's 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 a discussion, and it really it's quite different with different kinds of founders or different kinds of companies. So I wouldn't say that there's one one uh, format for for those meetings. And sometimes it could be just a short hallway discussion initially, sometimes a real real meeting at, at the office or somewhere else. Okay, then, then when you're interested in someone, how many meetings does it usually take to finalize the process? Uh, of course, it for sure depends, but roughly, and what's the timeline like? Well, sometimes there are obvious cases like let's say Vario, for example, the v, the VR and XR headset company that uh, two of the, the founding team members were actually looking to work at one of our our companies. And then I met, I met them and, and uh, thought that they shouldn't work at anywhere but they should found their own company and they were already interested in in that uh, and then we kind of discussed the uh, augmented reality or virtual reality and and they came back two or three days later having built uh, a prototype based on oculus rift and some cameras on top of top of that and they've written some software with unity and you know, then we kind of in that meeting we agreed on the on, on on an angel investment of half a million euros, which is rather small investment. But you know, the team we had really good chemistry. The team was super talented and experienced. And we had for years we had been whining about the fact that Oculus wasn't developed in Finland. We had all the experience and, and expertise here but in the US so kind of that was a super quick quick decision but sometimes you know there's we kind of di may discuss the plans and the and the industry and 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 other things in let's say five six maybe seven even seven times with the with the founders and it could take a couple of months uh, so it's it's also very different. Okay, that gives gives a good sense and, and and thanks for sharing the Vario case. I think it's always nice to get these concrete examples from from real life cases. Um, then of course today's topic is is on the the pre seed and seed stage. And of course you mentioned that there's no kind of material um, that you have to have ready to have a discussion. But let's uh, let's look at the kind of the pre seed and seed stage. How would you define like kind of what should be ready with the company to be able to raise those checks uh, to kind of come up and, and um, receive that investment for pre-seed or seed, both stages? Uh, well, I would say that the most important thing is passionate founders who can somehow prove that they get things done. Uh, like the Vario, Nick, Nico Aiden and Urho Kontori, they just you know, build this this pretty impressive demo in a couple of couple of days, and they they were still working working somewhere else. So you could see that hey, they they can move things forward to the right direction with very limited resources, and they they willing to spend a lot of time and energy with the project. Uh, so I think that's kind of the the most important thing like if if i look at the the best investments they have also been very scrappy in the beginning so uh, what i like to see with early stage investments and also later stage ones but it's especially early stage investments is that the team kind of they move forward without vc money or advice or anything else like if we have two meetings they have already They've already done a lot between the meetings, even though they would still work at somewhere else or be even if they were involved with some other projects. So they are not just waiting that, hey, if you would give us an investment, we could get something done. There's a big, big difference with, with that. And we are a bit 
uh, like even merciless with this like since if this doesn't happen then it's quite likely that the company doesn't go go forward after funding or at least it it won't become as big as we would we would like and you know if you, you, there, are, there are a lot of young founders who don't have any r significant experience in the industry so that's not that's not required but we try to but if you are really interested and if you're founding a company in specific industry, you should have some kind of a vision that can be explained and justified. Uh, and pure, pure intelligence and drive kind of actually compensates really well the lack of, lack of experience. And if, you, if you're doing something really ambitious, uh with with a good team you actually become a world leading expert in that area in a year roughly so it's it's kind of it's not a prerequisite it it will happen and we we're kind of happy to wait wait for that wonderful then uh before we jump into the kind of startups perspective uh one more question what would you wish finnish startups would do differently when they're seeking for pre-seed and seed funding? Well, um, I, I, I like the clarity of like, like the action plan, I would say. Like these are the exact things that we are doing now and that we will do next. And this is what we, this is what we will achieve with funding. Uh, and then this scrappiness that I mentioned like Vario for example has raised I think more than 100 million maybe roughly 100 million euros but a half a million euro investment was big enough in in the beginning and I, I can see projects that are not as capital intensive but the founders are looking for they say that okay we need at least 3 million or 4 million euros to get this started uh, and that's kind of usually the wrong wrong attitude like you need to or at least i like kind of projects where where the founders can figure out how to do this how to get moving with relatively limited amount of money and then of course when things start mature and they they have built proof for the for their company and the business then it's sometimes very straightforward to raise significant funding Okay, um, well, we touched upon already when is it uh, early enough to, to invest. So it's always, uh, no, not invest, but talk with investors. So that's, it's never like too early. Um, then maybe like, when should you choose bootstrapping and for how long as a founder? That was one of the questions we received. Yes, in most of the most of the businesses, of course, there are exceptions. Like Timo invested in P 2 X, which is a like a green hydrogen production company. So you can't bootstrap that kind of a company. Uh, but in most cases, I think the team should bootstrap always just start by bootstrapping and while they are discussing with with vcs they should be moving the project forward and basically just getting resources from wherever they can uh in in clever clever ways uh but then you know if if i look at projects that should never raise vc funding then i would say that if there's if the exit is really capped, like it's under even th even the theoretical maximum exit is under fifty million euros, for example, then it and it's a software project, for example, then it or a service project, then it would probably make sense to just try to bootstrap it and 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 and, and not maybe take some funding from angel investors or somebody else who has. Uh, 
who doesn't have VC like uh, like return requirements. It's it's much more it's much nicer to work in that kind of a context. Like it's it's not it's never easy to kind of disappoint. Although we, I, I think, I mean, as I said, most of our exits are, are this in the range of 10 to 50 million euros. And, and we're really happy and the founders are happy and we are, we, we don't, we're not disappointed. But in general, it's still easier, easier to bootstrap those, those cases. Wonderful. Then a bit more tactical question on the valuation. We get this a lot. Um, and I think like as a serial entrepreneur and investor, you, you probably have a, an interesting take on this, but kind of like how should the founder think about or come up with the valuation they propose the investor or how, like, how would you approach it as a founder? Yeah, I would. Um, the dilution is usually quite constant, like in, in almost every round. I mean, un, un, it starts to change if, if the, if the company is very successful and it's raising, let's say, C round or maybe even B round or later, then, you know, the dilution can be quite small, like 5% or 10% or something like that. But initially, it's usually 15 to 25%. So I would if I were an entrepreneur, and when I was an entrepreneur, I wasn't super focused on valuation. I was focused on clean, first the clean terms that there are no complex or, or terms like participate, participating preferred, for example, or these kind of things. Uh, a standard term sheet, a standard shareholder agreement. Uh, so that was the primary kind of a criterion then the other one was um, dilution so if you shouldn't dilute more than 25 percent in the beginning and i would rather keep it at 20 or even slightly below because you you probably need to do more rounds in the future uh, and then the last one is the valuation so there should be enough money for roughly 18 18 months typically because it's good for for the founders and it's good for investors that there's a clear clear kind of value jump between the first round and the next next round so it just makes things easier it's it's good for employees it's good for founders good the investor looks good like their numbers look good and it's everyone feels feels better so the valuations like really, they haven't changed that much in, in the good times and bad times in Finland. Like the, it's, it's a bit different in, ba in the Bay Area, for example, but they range from angel rounds, for example, like from even less than 2 million euros to five, six, maybe even 8 million euros and seed rounds from four to 15 million really depends now it's they they are down a bit but you know it's from our big fund it doesn't really matter if we invest we we don't want to compete with give just giving a high evaluation but it we prefer larger ownership and a bigger investment than uh, you know optimizing the valuation from our point of view Okay, um, then jumping back actually to the, the team a bit. So we got a question of how to approach team building and, and building the team. So let's say we have a founder that is just kicking off. How should they, they have an idea, how should they approach team building in the initial phase? Yeah, this is a hard, hard part, part that is some... This is an area where we think that we can help quite a lot. Like since there's a there's a tendency to hire uh, people that the company absolutely doesn't need. Like let's say commercial 
experts too early. And then if you are a bit too early, you may you probably are not able to get the best best people to these these roles. Um, and there are all kinds of details when 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 should you hire a CF, CFO, for example, or or, uh, or or what could you outsource and so on. So what what we and it it, it really depends on the industry and the and the company, but. I think a good rule of thumb is that if it's an early investment and the, there's no product market fit yet, like this, you can't sell the product to customers. Either, either it's, it's not ready or it doesn't have the right features or somehow you are not able to, to sell it, then I would say 90% of the focus in recruiting should be in people that improve the product market fit whether it's software developers or designers or maybe a single product manager or product expert but you know everything else is kind of an kind of extra or or maybe not not absolutely necessarily needed and it it kind of if you have that let's say a sales marketing people and so on it's it can be a distraction if you don't have product market fit they want to sell and they want to market the product that's not ready or service that that's not ready, and then you just uh, create the high too high cost base without really achieving much. So I would say that's in the beginning. Product market fit is everything, and I think when 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 our company has had a true product market fit, that really it's the product is very competitive, and 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 customers start using it, and the word of mouth works. It's like eighty percent of the success is already done. The rest yeah. is just scaling, and it's it's actually much easier. Wonderful. Then let's take a few of the questions we received throughout the forums, and let's uh, run them a bit more quickly, and then we'll open up the mic and see what uh, people that not yet have kind of asked the questions have have in mind. So uh, many have mentioned that Finnish investment circles are too small and amounts are too tiny. When should a startup start looking abroad? Is this uh, is it valuation related or round size related, or is there any real basis for such thoughts? It it really depends. Uh, like of course, for example, we can we we can just fulfill the, a very small part of the the final total financing need here and and even even all the vcs i mean it's it's not enough so i would say that it's up to the to the entrepreneurs it's hard to say uh not that many vcs let's say from london do angel investments in other countries but some business angels could could do that so you could if you want to take funding from abroad already for the angel run you could approach these business angels or some early stage investors like seed camp for example and sometimes we co-invest with with them like we flow right was an example and and there are other other cases cases like that it's hard for me to say whether there's too little money money here I would say that the valuations and the amounts are not very different if you take money from abroad or or from from Finland. Okay, then jumping forward, so any thoughts on startups that are created based upon founders PhD research? After reading about Relex founders, I thought that being a PhD student is a pretty smart way to develop a deep industry insight while also getting supportive access to a wide, wide range of relevant people. It is supervised and really disciplined customer discovery. Uh, in example, going deep into root issues before formulating a solution. What on, what's your take on, on that? Yeah, we, we have some very interesting companies founded by PhDs or, or researchers like let's say ISI for example this uh, radar satellite company that was a spin-off from Aalto University and the two founders are I think they are both PhDs but anyway researchers at least and uh, 
and a good example then another example would be tilt or onkos these are cancer drug companies and the founder is a is a professor akseli hemminki uh, so we have already invested in two companies from from him and 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 i think the what's important here is that Uh, you also need to know the industry, the commercial side really well, and the companies that already operate there. Like, like Axeli, for example, is it has always been super knowledgeable about what the big pharma companies are doing and who are the key people there and so on. So you need to cover the both both sides of the picture. All right, then then uh, we'll take one more from here. So what would you... What would be your advice for startup founders who were born in Russia but currently live in Europe with dual citizenships or residence permits when it comes to fundraising? Is a Russian passport a red flag for investors? I don't know. It of course it it's let's say if if there would be a Russian founder who would be pro war, for example, that there would definitely be a red flag for most of the investors nowadays but if there's a russian founder who kind of condemns the condemns the war and is 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 working on an interesting idea i think you know most of the investors would be very cool cool with that that it shouldn't be a shouldn't be a problem but it really this is more like an in if somebody has really If if the war has really gotten under somebody's skin, skin, and you know, of course, it's it's a personal thing for each each investor. But in general, it shouldn't be shouldn't be a problem. And of course, our companies employ a lot of Russian engineers and other experts, and it's it's not a problem. Maybe a bit of a funny question. So, Petre, you once said you are getting cool for uh, cool to games, yet your bio proudly proudly puts game stars forward. Are you back to the game, uh, the game by chance? And if so, what are your biggest opportunities you see in the gaming industry? Yeah, I guess here cool means cold. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I I still haven't. I I did a lot of games investments, but I haven't done um, any of them in several several years and the reason is that I'm just not excited anymore and I think the market is super saturated and there are these games focused investors like like uh, play ventures for example Henrik Suron and others and they are really good investors there and more they have more passion towards games than I do so I think you know that's that's why why I, I haven't invested anymore Wonderful. Then let's open up the mic for some questions uh, from from the crowd. So we have at least Annika here with a mic. So um, I don't know if we have someone else, but at least Annika can run there and Hanna as well. So please do speak loud and clearly to the mic. Hi, uh, I would like to ask you, how do you evaluate, let's say, the emotional regulation or the stress management of um, founders? What I have realized uh, in my own entrepreneur journey and interacting with other very ambitious individuals, I see very often that, um, you know, they go to very highs and then they go very lows. And um, so do you feel that is actually a criteria uh, for you to pick the companies that you invest in? We we actually try to evaluate things like that, and that's why we usually prefer having many discussions. And we also prefer if we can a situation in which we can observe how they work and how the, how the things proceed. Uh, and sometimes we even create some artificial stress. Uh, So it's 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 a very important criteria and almost impossible to completely, you know, to to really be sure about that that part. But it's something that we always, if there's a successful or a, a, f a failing startup, we try to help the founders handling this stress since we we've, we've had it as well and we also get it from our companies like if they're struggling or if if they are 
doing well, both situations are actually quite, quite stressful in different ways. Uh, if we will be fundamentally um, change or cure the root cause of stress, would you be interested in investing in us? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting position. But we would, all, I mean, we would use the same criteria as always, like what's the maximum outcome here and so on. But it's an interesting issue. Hi, Paul here from StaffTribes.com. Thanks for the talk this morning. What, what do you think about companies that have uh, like solo founder and non-technical non founder, but have a product and MVP? Yeah, so in, in general, we, we quite, uh, if if the company is building a soft a product, or we almost require it's not an absolute requirement, but it almost is 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 one that we need. Uh, we would like to see a technical co-founder or kind of a who can build the product because we've just seen that outsourcing n almost never works for a, for a startup if the if the development happens somewhere somewhere else uh, so especially in angel angel rounds for example it's very valuable if the team can kind of build at least a prototype of the product by itself but it there are no absolute rules but in general this is we really value a good technical or a product founder and 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 if they have got past that stage though even despite they didn't have the technical founder so meaning product is built. Yeah, we have we have some examples like uh, let's say Swappy, for example. The two founders are business people, uh, marketing and, and and business in general. And they in the beginning, for example, they didn't have any digitalization or kind of the back end of the company was very manual, even though it's a business that should be scaled. And then we, we kind of help them find uh, co-investors and advisors who help them build the technical team. Like Otto Hilska, for example, was there uh, as an investor and helped advisor and kind of bootstrap the they R&D R &D team. But it's, it's an exception. And it, it, it's, it, it's, it was a, or oh, it still is a marketplace. So it's not like they're building a, pure software product, for example. Or... Super, thank you. Hi, my name is Thomas Pollari. I work for the University of Helsinki, uh, an incubation program called Biosphere, focused on bio and circular economy. Um, we have been talking about um, money, but how about impact, positive or negative? Uh, do you, when you're looking for investment, are you looking at the impact, what the companies or the team is creating, either positive or negative, and how do you actually measure it? Thank you. Yeah, we um, we we have gotten a bit. Of course, we've always um, just personally liked companies that have potentially huge positive <laughs> impact, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have done like climate-related investments, for example, before it was it was fashionable. Uh, like we did Zen Robotics, for example, already 12, 12 years ago and many others. And uh, But nowadays we are also have a, a slightly more formal framework where we analyze the ESG aspects of the, of the investment. And uh, we, we've copied the model that Solidium, the, if you know the public, uh, the Finnish government entity that you know invests in public companies. They have a pretty interesting uh, ESG and sustainability framework. So we have kind of modified that for startups, and we we use it. So we try to evaluate that. And sometimes it's very obvious, like let's say Solar Foods, which is a company that can produce protein out of basically energy and carbon dioxide, like if that works, the impact is super, super big.
and, and sometimes it's a bit harder. But then, for example, I do these software investments where it's very hard to, you know, evaluate the, the impact. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, do you have um, startups that in your portfolio where there is a women CEO? And how much uh, percentage, if you evaluate it in your portfolio over the years, are women as co-founder? I think it's like a common discussion happening in the Nordics about this topic. Can you comment? Yeah, it's, it's still a too small, smaller percentage. We have like, let's say, uh, I would say we've had maybe five or six uh, female CEOs in our, and, and you know, 120 20 companies. So it's a rather small percentage. We'd love to, we have had quite a few co-founders, but some, but often the CEO has been, has been um, male. It's still a big, big problem, of course, in the, in the industry. And it's also like, of course, we try to evaluate projects very objectively, but it's somewhat harder for us to evaluate uh, a case that's, let's say, it's, if it's a femtech business, for example, or, or there are many areas that we just don't understand that well. Yeah, I have a VC related question. Uh, how do you track the key KPIs of your companies that you invested? And what KPIs across the portfolio do you track? We are quite different from several other VCs in a sense that we don't require the companies to report to us. Like if, if we, like we don't have like a template, for example, that our portfolio companies should use, but we rather focus on, on the companies knowing their own key KPIs and having systems in place that help them internally. And then if we are active there, we kind of automatically know, know the, the relevant KPIs. And they, of course, really depend on the, if it's, a, let's say, a typical SaaS company, you know, they're stand, very standard KPIs. If it's a hardware company, they're very, very different. But we don't ask the company. I mean, we have to collect for our investors. We have to collect a couple of times a year revenue and EBITDA and a couple of other things. But it's like a one minute, one minute job for the for the companies to report them. And how do you currently collect this data? Do you use some tools? I have a customer development question here. Maybe I'll build my next yeah. startup. Based no, on your response, yeah, yeah, no, we uh, for that we don't. I mean, we we get the get the reports from the companies, and our CFO just extracts the the numbers from there. For because of our, this system of ours, I mean, we don't need any tools tools for that. It's it's such a small small part of our business. Uh, maybe just building upon that, that you said that there are some industries that you don't maybe have a lot of knowledge like femtech that just out of curiosity that how often do you use like an external consultants or any other people to kind of like get the understanding of industries that you maybe haven't invested in or don't know that well we use every now and then like we we do quite a lot of deep tech investments even though that term is a bit kind of worn <laughs> worn out but uh, and and there we we work with outside experts, but then we also, I mean, this is probably a bit not very wise to admit, but sometimes we just invest in industries that we, and cases that we, we don't really know, know the technology, especially when we do angel investments. So it's sometimes easier if the, if the story sounds good, the founders seem really good, then we, it's almost easier just to invest half a million or to, than to try to really evaluate the technology and the, and, and the case and the market. 
because even even well, we've used McKinsey and several other experts and 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 I'm not sure whether whether kind of we we are wiser after those those rep having read those reports. What are some of the technologies or trends you're most excited about right now? Um, I'm kind of a, I, I don't get ex, that excited about trends in general. Like let's say AI, for example, it's a hobby, hobby for me. I every now and then do some programming there and so on, but I'm not super excited about business opportunities at the moment because from GPT or chat GPT or these other developments because they, the structure is a bit, bit strange and we didn't get super excited about crypto. We have just one blockchain investment and, and so on. I, I get quite excited about super boring possibilities. Like sometimes we get, get, get cases where you, where you have a very boring industry where you can do significant things and for some reason I, I get excited about those and it's very hard to because there's no competition there's no no tens of y combinator companies working on these solutions but rather they can be very empty there's room and 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 you can get a lot of visibility there if you if you if you are able to build a great solution so i'm i'm not really good at we i don't even try to think like what's happening next and what are the key key areas i of course hear about them like let's say industry automation now that the manufacturing is moving back to you know western countries for example but i try to keep my mind pretty empty with regards to tech and possibilities all right uh, thank you all and thank you petteri we hope in the future as well we will have the opportunity to have you here uh, and and let's give a huge round of applause for Petri. Thank you. For the participants here, uh, we have set up a new Slack channel called Fundraising. If your interest sparks, you can go there and get peer-to-peer uh, -peer support and discuss anything related to fundraising with the Mareser One members. Uh, for participants that are not members of Mareser One yet, I would point to Hanna Nylund here. Uh, Hanna has all the answers for questions when it comes to joining the community or the memberships that we offer here at Maria01. Thank you to everyone for participating. I wish you will have a fantastic day uh, and the opportunity to still meet some new people here in the event. Thank you.